Welcome everyone to another episode of CBSI Presents in the Spotlight Series. We are privileged once again to have Arun Singh, the VP of Marketing from Boom Studios, back to talk with us again. But before we bring him in, I want to introduce the co-host tonight. First of all, we have Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? Oh man, glad to be here, Brian. Excited for another episode of Indie Spotlight Series show. Uh, it's been a little while since our last one, and uh, definitely ready to rip and run. Also, want to introduce our third man, the third member of our NWO, our Hollywood Hulk Hogan himself, Andy Tomberlin from the Indie Spotlight Series on ComicBookFest.com. Oh wow! I don't definitely don't live up to that introduction, but uh, thank you, Jack. And uh, hey, everybody, Andy here with the Indie Spotlight series, and I couldn't be happier to have Arun back with us. Uh, he gave us so much information the last time, and can't wait to see what he's got up his sleeve this time for sure. Right. And with that being said, the last time we had Arun on, we are still getting comments on it, how great the interview was. So we're really glad to have him back. So I want to introduce the man, the myth. The legend, CrossFit Moses himself, Arun Singh. Hey guys, guys, I'm, I'm trying to read. Okay, I got really important reading to catch up. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you know from 1992. If you look at Wizard and their top 10 character list, these are all the hot books right now. Cable, right? Wolverine, Spider Man, Ghost Rider, Carnage, Venom, Spawn, Lobo. Right? Isn't this all the hot stuff right now? I should be looking for. But that, that, that's this year's magazine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wildcats is coming awesome. back? I mean, this, this could be a cover for now. No, this was uh, Bryce Carlson, who's the uh, VP of editorial here. And uh, uh, he's uh, him and I are big fans of Wizard. And so, um, or it impacted us a ton. So he gave me some old copies of Wizard. And like, these top 10 lists are still pretty accurate to who's hot now, except there's no Donnie Cates, because I'm not sure if he was born then. But, uh, you know, other than that, it's pretty accurate. Dude, that'll, that'll take you back in time right there, too, Walter. Yeah. Well, thank you all for having me back again. Really appreciate it. I had such a great time talking last time. For everyone who complained how I put my camera last time, hopefully I fixed it this time. Uh, but thanks, everybody, uh, for having me back. You've been busy since the last time you were on here, right? Yeah. You kind of foreshadowed some of the stuff that's come out recently. I mean, we talked about Power Rangers number 39. Power Rangers 40 just came out. Huge storyline coming up. So, I mean, you were true to your word of some of these books that were coming out. Um, you got SD San Diego Comic-Con on the horizon. Don't give us everything right up front, but <laughs> what's some tidbits of what we're going to talk about during this interview, I guess you could say. Well, look, I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about right now is this book, Power Rangers 40, because, oh, look, I bag and board everything here, guys. This is just how I roll. Uh, now I'm going to ruin it, but we're talking about it because I promised you last time, giant ending. And, spoiler, we revealed the all-new Omega Rangers, a new team of Power Rangers. It's Trini, Jason, and Zach. And you finally find out that they did not go to a UN Peace Conference. They became pow covert Power Rangers. Now, why did they do that? What's their mission? Um, what, who are they working for? Where are the Zords? All that's coming soon, but we promise you something huge. And we told you there's going to be another big reveal in here too, which was the time jump. So we got Rocky, Adam, Aisha, Power Rangers. I mean, and, and you know what the crazy part is? As giant as this issue is, it's going to get bigger. But I got to tell you, can I, hey, yo, Commander Bolo, can I call a Bolo audible? Yes, without a doubt. <laughs> all right well here's bolo audible i'm calling right now it is the dan moore ryan parrot and dan mora story variants i know it was hard to explain these in the press releases but let me tell you i know what the numbers look like for these covers there's not enough of them around because this each cover is a page from an 11 page story so it runs from power rangers 40 through 50 and i could only tell you what the where the story ends up you are going to want, you're going to need to read it if you're a Power Rangers fan. So get all these covers. Like, it's Ryan Parrott who's writing both books. Dan Mora, who's like an iconic artist for us. And like, as you can tell by the various costumes and designs, like, we're not messing around. This is taking you all through the Power Rangers world, through different um, 
through different iterations of Power Rangers, all in continuity with the Power Rangers book. So do not sleep on this cover because uh, what I can say is uh, sometimes things take a while to get collected if they ever do. And you're going to want to have these covers and not be waiting around for them to maybe be collected sometime. And honestly, on a very selfish level, this is a like a fanboy bolo. Uh, the foil covers we did, I'm not sure if you all have seen them. They look sick. We're taking those Goni Montez covers you loved from issue zero and other issues, giving them a nice foil treatment. Brainchild, again, of our boy here, Bryce Carlson, who is the only person I know more addicted to variant covers than I am who loves variant covers, right? Like when you do variant covers right, they're fun like this and they're fun like this. And he's got a great mind for it. So those are, uh, I think, Power Rangers 40. If you're not reading Necessary Evil, you've got to read it. And if you haven't been reading Power Rangers, if, you, if you've if you read Power Rangers 40, that's awesome. The book you don't want to sleep on next month. It FOC'd before Power Rangers 40 came out is Go Go Power Rangers 21. So that's going to take place right, uh, you know, in a time period, the time period right after the Power Rangers come back after Shattered Grid. Like what, because this book does a time jump. So you know they've come back from Shattered Grid. You don't quite know how and what happened. You'll learn all that in Go Go Power Rangers. But you're going to see how those Omega Rangers, that you're going to see the secret origin of the all new Omega Rangers in that series. And if you're a longtime Power Rangers fan, the Easter eggs are going to blow your mind. And if you're just like a fan of these comics, it's an all new team. You get to see their origin. Like, I, uh, it's just really awesome stuff. Very, very cool about the, uh, the storyline there, uh, running through, uh, the next 10 issues. There. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and that's big. The other one I want to call a Bolo audible on again is, uh, you know, angel number one and two, everyone knows about angel zero. It's, Got a thing behind me somewhere here. You know, we got that out with our cool Beyonce style stunt with the book. But with Angel 1 and 2, here's what I'll tell you without getting too deep into the numbers. I'm telling you, retailers under ordered. There is there are not enough copies to meet the demand coming for these books. You should hear a bit more about that coming up, about potential other printings. But you're going to want to get these. Issue number two has the first appearance of Fred, you know, played by Amy Acker on uh, on Angel. You saw that EW cover recently with the 20th celebrating the 20th anniversary of Angel. I was just a you know a couple weeks back at ALA Annual, the big book show in Washington D.C. this year. Folks were talking about Angel, talking and excited to check out this series. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of first appearances in Angel one and Angel two that are going to have a big role moving forward and you don't want to miss out on these first printings. So I'm just telling you, there's not enough in the market. I know a retailer should be ordering on this and I know it's a tough business, but they don't have enough copies in the supply chain to meet the demand right now. If you're a reader and you, and your comic book store isn't getting these books, make sure you're talking to your LCS and tell them, Hey, I want angel. I want power Rangers. Any of these books, check out previews, check out previewsworld.com, check out boomstudios.com and make sure you're getting that message to your LCS, letting them know that you want those copies. And if you can't find them on there, make sure, like I said, check out Boom Studios website because they sell comics on there as well. Ship great. So definitely check those out. Yeah. The other thing I'll tell you with Angel and with the challenge for retailers, and I'm totally sympathetic, is because we did that surprise launch, because we surprise dropped it. Uh, what happened is we didn't solicit preview this, these books and previews in the normal way, right? So we had to solicit one, two, three, and four all in the same month that four would normally solicit. So it's not that your retailer isn't awesome and isn't tracking numbers. It's these unique situations create challenges. And so I always love and respect everything that comic shop retailers do to get enough books on their stands. It's a tough business, but you know, these books, uh, we have a program called the Boom Guarantee that, re that eliminates risk for retailers. Um, and I think even with that, folks didn't order enough on this book. Again, first appearance of Fred, uh, the first trend that there is a, the first appearance of a villainous version, a character who has a major role in Angel coming up. Um, there are some big first appearances in this one. And I can tell you, keep reading Angel because 
Uh, we are going to have some more big first appearances, which we're going to announce that may not have been in previews, but we're going to announce it. So make sure angel, angel number four, do not sleep on that issue. I mean, you want angel number three because you want the next chapter of the story. But angel number four has a big first appearance, a really big first appearance for Whedon fans that you're going to want to be in on because it's going to be really big for the future of these comics. I love it. So that's a bolo right there, Civil Women's Comics family. Angel number four. That's the one you got to be on the lookout for. I like what you said there, though, Arun. Uh, definitely uh, a lot to unpack there. First thing I want to comment on is that uh, Power Rangers 44 will very back it up a step. Um, we kind of talked about that book last show. Um, it was definitely a book in previews. Again, card stock, um, dollar more uh, MSRP. So some people may have shied away from it, but man, I've got to compliment you guys. Getting that book in hand, that is an absolutely stunning variant. I, I can't tell you guys out there enough. If you haven't seen that book in person, and you talk about doing foil variants right. That's a foil variant done absolutely right. And you're definitely going to want to build that set. I think that 40 through 49 set is going to be incredible to put together. Um, and I completely agree with you on, the, we talked about this on the Bolo Show this week. Power Rangers 40 is a long-term play. So some people may be looking at it and they're looking for that quick flip. Stick with this one, guys. I, I talked about this before we got on the air. Um, I didn't grow up as a Power Rangers fan. I got into Power Rangers through comics recently. So I've been reading, and I, I totally have enjoyed reading the Boom series. My brother comes from a whole different um, angle. He's uh, about five years younger than me. He grew up diehard Power Rangers fan. So when he read this issue, he was so stoked about those things that you talked about. The time jump. Um, you know, bringing back the characters, explaining what was going on from the TV show. So it was it was amazing for me to read a book at the same time my brother did and see how we kind of unpacked different things from the issue. So um, I want to definitely give you guys kudos on that. I think you really hit the mark with long-term Power Rangers fans. And if you're not a long-term Power Rangers fan, I would tell you that I have jumped into reading Power Rangers comics and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think that it's something that if you haven't gotten into, Boom is making it really accessible for you to get into this world, feel really comfortable, like you, you know what's going on. Um, yeah, like I, we talked last week about my affinity for Lord Drac and how I think that that character is a, a monster. And uh, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with these Omega Rangers. I think that whole um, secret operative, operative Power Ranger thing is going to be really cool to read. Uh, going yeah. Forward. The thing I liken it to is like if you weren't remember when you weren't a Green Lantern fan, some people weren't because you know I don't know why Green Lantern rules. Right. But when Jeff Johns was doing Green Lantern and you had like Sinestro Corps, you first you had like the Green Ring showing up, you had Batman stuff, the Yellow Ring showing up, and you're like, what's going on? And then you had Sinestro Corps War, and you're like, holy, what is this is cool? And then you suddenly got to like Blackest Night, and I'm telling you like from what Kyle Higgins and Ryan Parrott did with Shattered Grid what they're doing necessary evil honestly as a fan i get those like it's not a one-to-one -one comp but i get the like uh sinestro core war blackest night vibes which is like personally if i hadn't been reading power rangers comics this would have got me to do it but like these are these books are made for you to to jump in and be a fan right away even if you've never watched the show and like you said if it's your brother man if you've watched the show it like I compared it to that Jeff Johns kind of like he's filling in the blanks, but telling a really good story at the same time. And that's what Kyle did. It's what Marguerite did with her run with Beyond the Grid, and like what Kyle with sorry what Ryan's doing right now with the two books. And he'll be co-writing um, Go Go Power Rangers with Cena Grace, who wrote Iceman over at Marvel. And like they got some really cool revelations in that book. Don't sleep on Go Go Power Rangers again. Let me tell you because. And you might be like, hey, Boom, didn't you cause this problem for yourself? Because of the way FOC works um, we ha and the way our schedules work, we had to FOC GoGo21 before Power Rangers 40. I'm telling you, there is not enough GoGo21 first printing that's going to be in the market. Get that first issue. You know, it's got cool revelations. I'm not telling you it's got like an Omega Rangers on the last page. But like if you want to know how they came about and you want to see the origin start, that origin starts like – 
it starts there. I always think about like Wizard, right? And I'm like, what is all the stuff that we like, we, we as fans look for, right? We look for first appearance, we look for death, origin, wedding. So if that's the way you like, you think about stuff like I do, and you, and this was like your comics Bible, then like, if you want to know where the origin starts, the origin of the Omega Ranger starts in Go Go Power Rangers 21 in July. You don't want to sleep on it. And if you um, pick up a copy uh, of it, and I got to double check the shipping date now, uh, and you have it at San Diego, we have seen a Grace Doom signs there. We can sign that. He can sign it for you. You know, like I, Ryan will be at, con at San Diego. He can sign books for you too. So, you know, for all of us who are like, we're all readers and we're collectors and we're speculators. And I think those are equally awesome things. Like, get a copy. Like, look, selfishly, get a copy to read. Get a copy to go get slapped. But get it signed. Um, you know, and and if you come by the Boom Studios booth, um, what I can tell you is we got some really cool exclusives for Power Rangers 40 as well. I know. Look, I'm the first to say I know on the on the collector side, there's a different um, perception sometimes about convention variants and like uh, store variants and all that stuff. And I won't pretend to understand the hierarchy. But you remember like last year at New York Comic Con, we did the Goni Montez Pink Ranger Dragon Shield cover, like where she's holding the helmet. And you're like, that's super cool. You know, Jose Meza, who runs our live event stuff here, uh, and he works on my team, like he's he's really big on trying to figure out these cool variants because he's like a diehard Power Rangers guy. So let me tell you, the Power Rangers variants we got at this show are awesome. The Power Rangers 40 variants are awesome. They're all going to be very limited runs. You're going to want to come by and get them. We also have a really, um, really cool special one we're going to be announcing soon that I am not promoting to you as a collector or a speculator. Um, I'm going to tell these boys offline what it is, but it's um, it's something you're going to see some a lot of media around. And it's one of those covers I actually think you're going to want to buy because it's uh, when you buy it, you're going to be doing a good deed. And you'll know what I mean when you learn more about it. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I we've seen we've had the privilege of of getting to see some of the uh, some of the exclusive variants for Power Rangers 40 that you guys have coming up. And man, you guys hit a home run on several of these covers. So yeah, yeah, great yeah. covers out there, guys. You know, if you if you're just looking at the ones that you see at your LCS, you know, you may be missing some. Again, and I agree with what Arun said. Some people feel some sort of way about retailer exclusive variants, things like that. But it's, it's really all about the quality. It's all about what they do. And, um, you know, I, one that stands out for me is that Scorpion Comics, uh, Clayton Crane, uh, is absolutely stunning. Um, I know there's like a Superman 233 homage that I think Legends did that is just out of this world. So, um, and then I know you guys got some coming up with SDCC, uh, Boom Store Exclusives and things like that. So definitely, definitely, um, a lot out there. And, and then, we, like we said, we tell you guys, Simple Men's Comics family follow the money. So you see the effort that Boom is putting into promoting this issue. You see the effort that they're putting into it. This is a big issue. So don't sleep on this issue. And I totally agree. Uh, Go Go Power Rangers 21 is one to be on the lookout for, for sure. The Go Go Power Rangers guys, remember, we got the same writer work and this is, this is the same storyline. This is going to be big. Don't, don't sleep on that. Don't look at that one like it's, you know, the, the outside continuity, it is right up inside continuity. It's, it's the same sort of value. You're going to want to get both. Uh, I'm a big advocate. I think the, the necessary evil set is going to be something that people are going to want to put together. Yeah, think about it this way. When Bendis was doing Avengers and New Avengers, you got to read them both together. You can read Power Rangers, Go -Go, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Go-Go Power Rangers separately if you want. Like, I don't want to force anybody into it. I'm just saying... If you're like, holy, I, don't, I can't swear here, holy crap. I, I, I came to talk to you about your potty now. It's, uh, it's the Omega Rangers. I want to know more. Why would you, like, as a fan, if you're telling me I can hear about it them two times a month instead of just one time a month, I'm going in for the second fix, guys. And so, like, that's just kind of like, as a fan, that's how I look at it. It's why, like, I enjoy double shipping on books I like. Cool, I get it twice in a month. That's awesome. Absolutely. Obviously, like you need the budget for it, and I hear all that, but like it is, um, it's. I think we've proven with Power Rangers comics, like you said, like your brother said, we deliver on those, and it's, uh, you know, I, I can say I'm proud to say one thing. The proud of being here at Boom, there has not been a bad issue of Power Rangers anything from issue zero yeah. for three years. There has not been a single bad issue of Power Rangers in the company, and I and I can't, I can't 
oversell how excited my brother was after reading it to, you know, yeah. to unpack everything. So to sit back and watch that, that was just last night. So to sit back and watch his reaction to that um, before coming on here and getting to do this interview, I said, oh, man, these guys really hit the mark because I enjoyed it. But watching his reaction was just a whole nother thing. So yeah. uh, definitely excited to keep going and see what um, see what that reaction is from people. Um, definitely excited. Issue 41, guys. Be on the lookout for that one coming soon as well. So then, then I want to pivot to Angel. You talked about Angel, Angel number one and Angel number two. Um, another thing we talked about on the Bold Low Show, um, you know, this Angel series, we've noticed some of the incentives selling out at large retailers. Those thank you variants have been insanely popular. Yeah. Uh, and I think people are really sleeping on the first appearances that you mentioned. Brian highlighted uh, the first appearances on our Bold Low Show last week. I, I totally agree. Um, have you seen this translate? Has there, has there been an increase in fandom of the, you know, the Buffy universe, Angel? Have you started to see some real momentum building? It's something we're starting to notice on the secondary market. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. Like, I see on the secondary market, Angel number two was selling above cover price before it came out, which was awesome and crazy. But I was also like, I do want people to just get the book to read it. Um, so, uh Definitely with Angel. And the example I use is we were at, a so ALA, the American Library Association, a couple of weeks back, we were at the uh, annual show, which is Washington, D.C., and people lost their minds when they came and saw Buffy Volume 1 and Angel Zero on our shelves there. Um, we've definitely found the reviews for Angel have been crazy good. Buffy, if you look at the attrition numbers on Buffy, Buffy has, like, has had minimal attrition relative to, like, where you'd expect it to be firefly the exact same way i'm telling you like the rarest issue of buffy it was number two maybe now it's like number six but like number two was the rarest buffy issue for a bit which means all the slayer variant slay, team slayer team vamp variants are rare all the like um you know historical uh slayer variant on that book is rare Every, you know, all the any of those incentive covers are rare on those books by extension, but I think Buffy 2 was the rarest there. But yeah, like to your point, we've had a really good response to the book. The critical claim is off the hook. Um, the response isn't good. I'm not sure if y'all you, you got a chance to read Angel, but like Brian is doing really cool horror stuff with this. And like Brian's a really versatile writer. Like um, if you look what he's doing in American Carnage or Batman and the Outsider, and you look at Angel, they're different stories, but he's got like this knack for the turn of the phrase and for like getting to the point. Like he is such a skilled writer. It's um, I think the more we get into Angel, people are seeing what we're doing. They're seeing familiar faces like Fred and again, Angel number four, another big familiar face. Um, but Angel number three is the first time you get to see more of Fred as well. So don't sleep on it, but Angel four, big first appearance. We just announced Angel number five is a prelude to Hellmouth, which just today we announced on Canada Day, which is only important to me, we announced it, Hellmouth is the first ever Buffy and Angel comic event. What does that mean? There's a hell, like, think of all the big Marvel events, Civil War, Siege, Secret Invasion. They always had like a core series. So there'll, there'll be issues of Hellmouth, one, two, three, four, five. And then Buffy and Angel will tie into that. And so this is huge for us. Um, you're going to have Angel and Buffy face to face. Um, you're going to have these characters from the Angel and Buffy comics crossing over into the various series. And so much of that kicks off with and, and is impacted by Angel. So Fred, big role in this. The character appearing in issue number four of Angel, big role in this event. Um, so don't sleep on that stuff. That's going to be awesome. And frankly, Hellmouth written, you know, we've now it's written by, uh, uh, Jordi Belair and Jeremy Lambert, who's working on Doom Patrol, Gerard Way. So good. They have such cool plans. And when you see where that event ends, you're going to just like, you're going to wish you had these copies of Angel because you're going to be like, oh, that character, their first appearance was an Angel one. Oh, their first appearance was an Angel two. You're going to wish you had those issues. So like me as a fan, I always say, like, I, I got a whole stack of, like, uh, graded comics here recently that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to um, probably show you some of the random stuff I bought from back issue bin. Like, me as a fan, I would I would wish I had these issues. So I'm telling you, make sure you have these issues. And then, like, bring in the New York Comic Con. The cast of Angel is reuniting there. Get them signed. 
no doubt, no doubt. Signed copies are always my favorite. I can tell you that now. I mean, there's just something about signature series, and or not even that, even just a raw comic with the, the creator on, on the front of yeah. it. That's huge right now. Um, it, okay, I, I want to get into something else, too, a little bit here. Creator-owned projects. You, you seem to be working on those well. You've had several big hits. What's some of the next stuff on the horizon that you've got coming up? Well, I feel like I might have mentioned Bone Parish last time, and now that book is impossible to get at a good price. So, I think yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> but you know, so Bone Parish. Um, no, uh, you know, if I was going to spotlight the one book, like you know, it is Once in Future. It launches in August by Kieran Gillen, uh, Dan Mora, and company. Um, it is a beautiful book. Uh, you know, you know, Kieran, you know, Dan Morris track record, right? Power Rangers and Buffy and Klaus with Grant Morrison. So this guy is just hit, 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 hit. And then, you know, Kieran Gillen from all his crazy Marvel stuff from Star Wars, from Wicked and the Divine. And we all know what Die is doing right now. Right. And so the pledge that we made to comic retailers on Once in Future is that we're only going to do one cover in comic shop. Because retailers keep telling us, you know, look, we don't want all these crazy variant covers all the time. We only want one cover. Make the book, you know, returnable for us. So we announced, you know, in an industry like uh, the uh, first time ever, every issue of Once in Future, no standard variants. Like stores may still do their own variants, but like no standard variants going into stores. Every issue is to be returnable for retailers investing in it. And, uh, you know, we're going to make the collections returnable. I'm going to tell you right now, I look at what dies on what is fifth, sixth printing somewhere right now. Crazy. Yep. I'm, I'm telling you, if I was a retailer looking at, at once in future, I'd say, let me put together my die numbers with like from each printings one through five and see what I actually needed. Because this book is awesome. Um, it is as someone who's known Kieran for 12 years. And I think he would joke with me that uh, his Aries miniseries, I always say was like one of my favorite things. Uh, this is my favorite. This is my favorite, not only Dan Moore comic, because Dan's in Crow Arts, my favorite Dan Moore comic, but it is my favorite Kieran Gillen comic I have ever read. Kieran Gillen's amazing. Wicked and Divine is awesome. You know, Phonogram, awesome. I love him and McKelvey. I love him and Stephanie Hans. I love him and anybody. He and Dan Mora, like, just as a reader, are such a dream team. And I'm telling you, I don't think, I don't know if retailers can anticipate the demand for this because once people read this book, they are going to, they're going to be in. It, 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 it does, you remember what Kingsman kind of did for the spy world and, Indi and, uh, and James Bond? This kind of does the same thing for Indiana Jones and that kind of adventuring kind of world. And it is so good. And um, my, Kind of bolo, if you want to call it this, is if you're really excited about uh, Once in Future, you're a big Kieran Gillen fan, make sure you come to the Boom Studios Discover Yours panel uh, at Comic-Con. I can't remember if we're allowed to announce the date and time quite yet, <laughs> but we have a panel. It will. Uh, if you're a Kieran Gillen fan, you're going to want to be at that panel because he's on it. But if you are interested in Once in Future or and you like walking away from panels with something that no one else will ever get, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm being too subtle here, <laughs> you have to come to that panel. Oh, I you love have it. To. So, um, and, you know, there is, uh, you have to. And if you're, uh, and if you are a retailer, you have to come to the Diamond uh, Summit and speak with uh, Philip Sablick, our president uh, of publishing and marketing, and uh, Morgan Perry, our direct market. Um, she's our sorry, our, she's our sales coordinator and who handles everything direct market. Um, you got to come meet with them both. You're going to want to do it. It is a good investment of your time to be at the panel or meet with our sales folks because it's a good investment of your time. It will be a good investment for other reasons. Am I being too subtle, guys? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, be there. 
because what will happen is these wonderful gentlemen here who may or may not be, a, are you guys at San Diego? I am not, unfortunately. I'm East yeah, Coast, so I'm, uh, that's a long trip. Right. Anybody? Jack, you there? Uh, yeah, no, we'll be at San Diego okay. this year. So you can be Brian, Jack, and Andy and be boloing for something that you're not going to have or you can be at San Diego and come to that panel and get to rub it in Brian Jack's and Andy's faces. And if you do, tag me on Twitter. I'll retweet it to rub it in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's that's a dirty move. That's a dirty move. <laughs> well, guys, guys, hotels are only $1,100 a night at San Diego right now. Come on. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that's uh, that's one trip that I, I I wish I could make and I will make uh, here shortly. But uh, it's definitely oh, yeah. just not in the cards. Bound, bound and determined to do that next year. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So like, make sure you're there for that panel. Make sure you come by. There's some cool stuff. We know uh, we want to treat fans right. Um, you know how Boom does it. Be at the panel. Uh, yeah, I think one's a future. That's that's our next big one. We thank you everybody for getting behind Faithless as much as they did. I actually, I, I've actually seen an increase in some of the uh, in some of the other covers on the on with Faithless on the secondary market. That book's selling crazy good for us. We're so excited by the response to the standard covers, the erotic covers, the the other creator variant covers. So like, thank thank you and everybody else reading this for like reading the book because it's an awesome book. But it, that's a, it's a really cool cover program too. Yeah, hundred percent. It's an awesome book, and yeah, you're right. You can look at the sales uh, info on it, and it's it's definitely trending up. It's got the little slow burn feel to it, and uh, especially the first print or, or the number one second print uh, arrived. Yeah. I told you guys, didn't I tell you? you? You're, you're, you're bolo. It, it paid yeah. it off right there. So yeah, yeah it's uh, it, that that's a good one for sure. And uh, it's we definitely cannot, we cannot show the cover on this video. We're clear on that, right? And she showed me her boobies, and I like them too. No, 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 I've seen somebody attempt that one time before on a live video, and uh, they had to cut it real quick. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing that. So, no, I mean, look, at the end of the day, like, these original series are at the heart of what we do at Boom. You know, Ronan Island was a big launch for us this year, too. Um, you know, uh, we talked about Faithless. Once in Future is, is that next big Boom Studios, you know, imprint launch. So, definitely... Uh, Follow that because here's the thing we learned about we learned about Die with Kieran Gillen and I go back to them kudos to all our friends at Image Die had what two covers like main covers yep. and you can't get those things anywhere close to to cover any price anymore even the multiple printings are on those so like if I'm just looking at the market behavior you know without knowing that Once in Future is a transcendently good it's got 30 pages of story no additional cost. 30 pages of story, 30 pages of Dan Mora, beautiful art. And it's, uh, you know, uh, it is, it is amazing. Uh, you know, these fine gentlemen here may end up with something in their inbox shortly to take a look at. Um, but it's, uh, it's a real good book. Yeah. I, uh, I can't wait for that one. And, and you've heard him. Uh, you don't sleep on what this man tells you. I'm telling you, because, uh, <laughs> as you've seen, it's, uh, it, it, it does come to fruition or, or pay off in some way, uh, shape or form. So definitely be one. I, uh, I'd be going to your LCS to try and reserve your copy now for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one creator owned title that we heard from, uh, the simple Foods comics family, uh, that they wanted us to talk about that we maybe didn't really get into last time was that of Black Badge. There seems to be a, a real strong following for that book. That was the book that I think most people were saying to me when, when it was around issue five and I hadn't yet started reading it yet, that um, Dan Piercy from the reading pile on comicbookinvest.com, shout out to Dan. Uh, he was a big one advocating that book. And so many of our followers uh, on the Bolo show were commenting about Black Badge. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that one? How, how has that book been received? Um, I, I know the hardcover is just released, or it's coming soon. Um, you know, uh, for the first volume. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. Black Badge? Yeah, Black Badge is. Look, we love Matt Kent. Um, I'm gonna give you my uh, Bolo Audible on Black Badge. You don't sleep on that Jeff Lemire variant to issue number one. I don't think there's as many copies out there as people think there are. And I wouldn't be surprised if people undervalued that book and there's probably less nine eights out there than people think there are now. 
Um, the other one, Don't Sleep On, that was the rarest black badge cover. We sent one to comic shop retailers that had a black badge badge attached to the cover that you could sew onto a jacket. And that was done in uh, sub 500 quantities. So that is an incredibly rare one. It was poly bagged. It's really hard to find. And I think that is one to, to pay attention to. But yeah, Black Badge is an exceptionally well received. You know, it's going to wrap up its run um, uh, late, uh, soon uh, and run all 12 issues. But I can tell you, we love Matt Kent. I think Matt Kent loves those too. And we are going to be uh, announcing a new Matt Kent project um, in August. You will learn more about the next Matt Kent book in August. I also don't know how many of you um, Eagle Eye people saw some of the like mind management um, drops in Black Badge. I, I don't want to speak for Matt and how much everything is or isn't connected, but like Matt's really cool about like dropping little hints. And if you're smart, um, I think you'll also see a connection to Grass King's drop somewhere in there too. So like, you know, Matt's an incredible creator. I will tell you the next project we have with him is not like Black Badge, is not like Grass King. Um, I just read the outline today. Editor Eric Harburn, he's the guy behind a lot of hot books like Bone Parish or Abbott or Black Badge or excuse me, Klaus. He's um he's got he's a really like he's a really smart dude. And uh, him and Matt work together on this new book that is uh, not what you expect. And I read the outline. I just read it with the last issue uh, or issue five, I should say, um, is it's a limited series. So what issue five um, does, and then my mind was just blown. He's on, he's on the office today and I DM'd him. I'm like, dude, this is effing amazing. So like, if you like what Matt Kent does, just wait for the next one. Um, you know, that's going to be, we're going to announce that, that, that project in, uh, in, August, August, and uh, you should be, you should stay tuned. This is, uh, we're in that, we're in the Matt Kim business, and it's a great business to be in. Yeah, no, no doubt. It sounds like it for sure, and that's some really good information on that uh, subpar five hundred uh, black badge book to be on the lookout for because uh, that's yeah. pretty cool. I'm a huge fan of black badge, and I, I had no idea about that book, so uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. It only went to retailers um, in the Boom Guarantee program. So that's a free to sign up program we have with retailers that gets them like returnability, these standees, um, a lot of cool stuff. I'm not trying to like be like an advertisement for it. I'm just saying like it's one of those perks for a free program you sign up for. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and we sent that to them last year. And like it is, I don't think there's actually enough copies that you probably be able to find them Um on eBay, you might be able to run any of the secondary markets. I'm not sure if what's cool and not cool to mention, but I will say it's the rarest one. And it is, um, it is like, if you took the badge off, essentially it's a sketch cover at that point, but it's, uh, uh, it is, it's really rare. That's one. And the Lemire variant too, like was really sick. And like, again, I think, um, I think black badge is, uh, it's a special book on Matt Kim books that got something really cool about them. And, you're, and if you love those, his next one, I love Black Badge, especially I think it was issue two with the Canadian team. Yes. Like that was really fun to me. Like that, I cheered yeah. them like, yeah, go Canadian. Yeah. And like, I like Matt as a human being. Like he's this warm, affectionate, incredibly smart guy. And like, it's not fair that he's so talented and so nice. Um, <laughs> but he's, uh, his next book is probably my favorite of everything he's done here. Black Badge was my favorite. Like I love Grass Kings, but Black Badge was like my jam. And then uh, his new book is, as much as I love Black Badge, like if Black Badge was a 10 out of 10, this book is like a 12, this new one's like a 12 out of 10. It's wow. So good. Wow. Yeah. I'll, I'll say something there. And then I'll yeah. say this. If you're an old school Red Dawn uh, fan, then check out Black Badge because it, it's, it's kind of uh, goes, goes along with that feel. Yeah. Sure. And I, I definitely agree. Uh, he's a great guy. I got a chance to spend some time at Heroes Con talking to him. Uh, a absolutely personable guy. Um, it was down to talk everything comics, everything to book, and um, would love to talk to him. Would love to have him on the Indie Spotlight too. Show it. I, I feel like I know someone who can maybe connect you with someone else. I don't know. It's just crazy. <laughs> you might know a guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So 
yeah, I think, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to show you guys, if you don't mind, is, you know, we're all collectors here. Yes. I got some books I want to show you. I've been like, so at WonderCon, at my local comic shop, Earth 2 Comics, Sherman Oak, shout out, shout out to Carr, to Susan, to Heather, to Streets, to all the cool folks who work there. You're my number one and only destination for comics in LA. There's many awesome stores. Visit your store, but this is my store. So, um, randomly, uh, like, I just saw this and I'm like, I have to have the hologram cover, oh, right? Yeah. Gotta have those holograms. Nice. Um, do you guys remember this uh, die cut Wolverine cover? I do. That's awesome. Yeah. I was just like, that's my childhood. That's all I was about to say. That's that, my that whole storyline is awesome. 48 so, like, you may not know this. I'm a diehard U.S. agent fan. Like, I will, I will, the hill I will die on is that Force Works is awesome and U.S. agent is what makes it awesome. So, like, I picked up some, like, I, I, I got to be honest with y'all. I bought these online and it reminds me why I'm hit or miss about buying back issues online because you never quite know what you're getting. Uh, so they got some of them were a bit more dinged up, but like the uh, first U.S. agent. Uh, and I got to tell you, here's a funny story about this. I think maybe some of y'all will relate to this. So like I couldn't sleep one night and I was like, for some reason, all I could think about was U.S. agent. And I'm not kidding you. I woke up in the morning and I saw the eBay receipts and Gmail. And like, I don't think I like sleepwalked and ordered comics off eBay. I just forgot I had ordered comics at like two or three in the morning off eBay. So I ended up with like uh, two copies of this. I don't know why. Like, I wanted this forever, but I don't know why I have two copies. Um, and then I ordered, like, you know, the uh, first John Walker. Uh, and then the first, you know, John Walker as Captain America. So, like, that's my ish. And then I think I did what everybody did after Avengers Endgame, which was, you know, we all did it. <laughs> you know, and this was, these are these. So, I'm really stoked. I was stoked about those. Um, however, I just got my la my newest uh, batch of books back from CGC. So, like, I think I told you guys before, Ross Ritchie, who's over here, he really got me into CGC comics. And I showed you guys a hot fan last time. Um, and him and Bryce are, uh, you know, whenever I can, I try to jump in with them and put my share in for like whatever books were getting graded. Uh, so I'll show you some of the stuff I got back that I'm pretty stoked about. Oh man, I just noticed it came back cracked. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> that, that's a real life. I'm not happy. Okay. Oh, no. Hey, oh, we, got, we got a 9.6 that came back. So these are all raw copies I had graded. Um, we have a 9.8 that came back. Pretty stoked about that. Okay, so here's the fun stuff. These are, the next ones are all signed by Stan Lee. Oh, I got man. a 9.6, first issue of the Miles Morales book. I gotta tell you, I'm pretty bummed by this one, but it's Avengers number four, the movie variant that they did. This is the Bendis run. It's an 8.0, but it's signed by Stan. So, you know. And this is the one that's cracked. It cracked. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but this is uh, Avengers number four. Again, this was the Fan Expo variant by Phil Jimenez, wow. signed by Stan Lee. So 9.6. A 9.6, I've always been taught that for, like, modern comics, like, you should be going for a 9.8. Um, but, you know, considering these sat in long boxes and moved from New York to L.A. and I forgot to ever grade them, I think that's actually pretty good. It, only, it wasn't worse than a 9.6. Um, those. That's, that's yeah, awesome. so the, yeah, those are my new ones. I'm hoping to get some other ones back soon. I'm gonna get some books signed at San Diego. I've been like, I've been trying to crush like maybe you you all have been in the same place. And if you want to gab about this or not, but like, I've been like crushing like any old X Men comics I can find, like Claremont, Jim Lee, like because I think we're all playing the same game of like, man, what's the uh, like, what are they gonna turn into like a movie next, right? Or like, what's gonna be a thing? So. Maybe we talked about it last time, but like the book I was chasing down a, a good nine eight copy of, and I think I finally got one raw was X Men number four, the first Omega Red. Oh man, that's the first book I was gonna mention. That, that yeah, is that's biggest, one because that I, is my biggest book that I think is gonna pop with the yes, next X Men movies. Because it's like he's been in the video games, you know, he's just been around in enough stuff that we all know him, and he's like major enough. And um, 
so I've been going through like trying to find all those first appearances, um, you know, because I think what people do is they usually go back to like the Claremont burn stuff. Right. And yeah. they're like Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. And that's awesome. But like, um, I'll tell you the one I think, and I know nothing. I actually would be curious if the age of apocalypse stuff or onslaught ever happened in the comics, right? Like onslaught feels like age of apocalypse would be tough, but like onslaught feels like a thing you could do. Like you could have Xavier and Magneto combine the consciousnesses or whatever and like do a real cool Onslaught comic. So like Onslaught's the next thing I'm trying to track down like good quality copies. And it's so dumb to me because like five years ago, guys, these were like in dollar bins, right? Yep. Yep. And then I blame you guys. I blame all of you. <laughs> and then it's people like me giving it away. Yeah, like now it's legit. And we're all like, but can I tell you like, I know I'm going on a tangent here, but like it, this is really fun, right? Like this yeah. is fun. Like. Dude. I don't get stressed. I love this. It's cool. I'm an yeah. indie guy. I'm an indie guy. You see what I'm? I got uncanny. Oh, yeah. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing my thing too. So yeah. that's that's who I'm betting on. Yes, I, I yes. You're that's. I think it's a pretty safe bet in the always be my maybe crazy rich Asians world. Like <laughs> she's the only she's the only Asian American character other than like only Asian American character. Yeah, you can play with like that. Um, yep. at least from that classic run. So like, yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's funny. We just talked about that on the Bolo show last night with uh, um, Always Be My Maybe and Crazy Rich Asians and just a plethora of amazing Asian actors and actresses yeah. out there right now. Now is the time to quit the whitewashing and um, get these kind of uh, castings correct. My, my philosophy on where I'm trying to speculate, again, guys, I know nothing either. Um, this is just purely my opinion. I agree with what Arun said. I see most speculators going back to that Claremont stuff. And this is just, again, my thought as, as Disney takes over this franchise. I think they're going to try to go away from what Fox has already done. So I think they're going to stay away from all of those storylines. So I agree. I think the Jim Lee run, I think that Onslaught and some of the more modern stuff is much more in play than I think people really realize. Um, and I also think that they're going to look at it like, these are more modern, but they're still, what, we were talking at this point, like 30 years ago. So, oh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's to, to date all of us, but you know, here, you know, we're, we're, it's our childhood, but it's still, it's still, it's, you know, 30 plus years ago. So we're, we're 20, we're, let's, say, let's say 25. Can you just help me? 25. Out here? Okay. Yeah. Well, 25 years ago. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that the way that Disney will look at it is we are the core audience and they're going to try to do a story that, is going to resonate with us. So that's why I love, as you mentioned, Omega Red. Um, I think a lot of those kind of um, early, uh, early X-Men Jim Lee books are underrated. And I know I'm going to get killed for saying this because I understand that the print run is 8 million, but I still love the 1991 X-Men number yes. one. I think it's too cheap I think because I think yes. it's one of the most iconic books ever. Um, and I think people get mistaken when they hear that 8 million, they have to remember that that's amongst all the covers. Mm -hmm. uh, um, some of the covers have been sitting in quarter bins for 20 years plus and have been just dinged and destroyed beyond belief and ignored. And I love cheap spec. I love being able to, you can go right now, you can load up on that book. You can, you can make purchases. And if five years from now, X-Men as a franchise is dominant for Disney, like I think we all expect it to as comic fans and who grew up X-Men fans. Um, I think that book is gonna become iconic even more than it is already. I think X Factor 71 is another one just waiting to pop. It's a great like, point. Yeah, just like mutant team, like government team. Yeah, I know they had the Freedom Force, but calling it X Factor, that's there. Like that's that's like a book, that's a book that's had like moments in time where it's it's gotten kind of popular with speculators, but that is that X Factor seventy one. That's a regular dollar bin book that you can find out there. Um, that I agree, it's a, it's a first appearance with legs. The whole mutants storyline, it just and it's not to discredit anything Fox did. I think some you know some of it was great, but some of it wasn't. And, and um, I have full faith in the MCU to do that right. And there's so many topical stories that can be told right now that I think are going to connect with people, especially with all we've got going on with immigration and everything like that. Um, I, I just think that that mutant stuff is is bound to hit. Plus, again, we all grew up on the X-Men. 
to all of us, the X Men was as big as it gets. The X Men cartoon was my absolute yeah. jam. Yeah. So like, best theme song on TV. I don't care. I still say it. so. Um, you know, to, we need that depiction in the movies. And all all I want is that blue and yellow suit done right in the movie. Yeah. That's all I want. Can I please have? So let, let me tell you. So real quick, the other book I'll say is I think the first issue of Grant Morrison's run with Cassandra Nova for her her first appearance. I think that is going to be. There's no way they didn't, don't do Cassandra Nova. Like, what's new? So here's what I'll tell you that you guys will find funny. So married, wedding ring. Um, this wedding ring, you, you know why I bought this? And I tweet, and I Instagrammed this and tweeted it the day I got married. I bought this ring because it looks like the grooves on, like, the side pouches and, like, the arm pouches that Jim Lee used to draw in Cyclops. <laughs> That's why my wife and I chose this ring, because she and I love X-Men so much. Love so, that. like... I say this from like X Men and Legion of Superheroes, like you know that's that is my stuff. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just wanted to geek out with you guys. Sorry, I didn't mean to take a total. No, you're good. I want to say like Jack, you talked about like the Jim Lee run, the later run, the '90s run of X Men. I would also see with the way they're going with Miles Morales, um, St- uh, Samuel Jackson with Nick Fury, some of those ultimate the ultimate storylines too with X Men. I mean, they might be p- picked up for MCU. I'm not. I'll probably get slapped in the face, but I've always been more Avengers. I'm not the big X Men X Men fan, so I'm Brian, right. Brian, you're breaking up, Brian. I'm sorry, we can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I didn't get that. You're dropping either. out. I, I just need to hear that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's why Brian and I work though. We're the yin yang. I don't think we ever agree fully on yeah. anything. We like always come from different. Yeah. So I will. I hate the Avengers. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. I do disagree on that. Your favorite theme song of TV all time. Is definitely wrong because everyone knows DuckTales is the best theme song <laughs> ever. <laughs> it's got Ric Flair in there. Woo! Oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. No, it's uh, look. A- a- anytime you can bring back to wrestling, I can remind you. Make sure you get your copies of WWE yes. Forever number one, so I can sign them for you because I won't charge you for CGC grading. But then again, <laughs> I don't think they have my signature on file either. <laughs> <laughs> they will they will Don't so worry. somebody so po- think about the low population report somebody needs that cgc gold label a room sing sign <laughs> wwe then now forever number one yeah. you can have that one of one yeah, no doubt <laughs> and they may have it more coming up because i think you're you're doing something else coming up too right yeah man uh i uh i yeah in october in comic shops and the november in bookstores we're releasing wwe then now forever which collects a bunch of these stories from these specials about super, your favorite wwe legends um and superstars um and so uh, my editor chris rosa was gracious enough thanks to the really great response we got to the irs story he um Actually, he did something. I he helped me do something I'm really thrilled about. It really means the world to me. Which is, he commissioned me to do a 10-page Jinder Mahal story. And so, I I mean, look, let's be the obvious thing. We're both him and I are both brown guys. There's not a lot of us in comics. I wanted to be able to tell a story, but also he's Canadian born like I am. And so, um, it's a story about on the eve of WrestleMania 34, Jinder Mahal tries to make peace with the locker room who all hate him and um it's a 10 page story about that it's got the sing brothers in there um it's got uh, they if you read it it's got the origin of their alliance with alicia fox in there real quick um it is uh and it's honestly it was a lot of fun it's a it's a it's a heavily a comedy story i'm reteaming with kendall good um who is my who is the artist who works with me and collaborated on the last story um rusev and aiden english um are a huge part of the story um all of aiden's dialogue is singing and rhyming and it was a lot of fun to write it and so if you're a fan of those characters um uh, you'll definitely dig it and if you're not what i tried to do was approach it as though like jinder mahal is a character that fans boo because he's a heel but like how do you present a sympathetic but honest version of that character and then let the reader decide if they agree with him or not and so the story is called My People, um, because he always talks about my people in his promo videos and as like a promos. And I wanted to really explore what that term can mean, because sometimes I think we look at those kind of terms and we think um, very narrowly about what it means. And I, I took the approach with gender that 
it might mean something different than you think it does. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a fun story about Jinder Mahal. Uh, and I'm really appreciative of Chris. I got a chance to do it. There's not a lot of Asian American representation or Asian Canadian representation in, um, in, in comics, uh, in pro wrestling, despite everybody's best efforts. Right. And so to get the spotlight gender and the Singh brothers was a, was a real treat for me and meant a lot. Um, and I'm really proud of this story. Um, so, you know, uh, I hope everybody checks out in that collection. You'll get, you'll get stories from a lot of other talented writers and artists, Michael Kingston, Land Pitts, a whole bunch of other really great folks who did some great work in there. So, um, I hope you check out the Jinder Mahal story. Uh, you can, you can pre-order WWE Then Now Forever Volume 4 in, um, comic shops, at anywhere, at your, anywhere that sells books. And you can also go to Amazon as well and just search it and you'll find WWE Then Now Forever Volume 4. You can pre-order it personally if you could. I'd really love if you go to your comic shop and do it because support your local LCS. Um, without them, we don't have um, weekly comics, and I love going to buy comics every week. Now you opened you opened up the door to talk wrestling, and I gotta say I love yeah. I absolutely love Ginger Mahal. Um, I didn't know this before we got on here that that you were writing a Ginger Mahal story. Oh, cool. And I think that that I think that that's absolutely amazing. Um, if for, for those of you who aren't aware, Jinder Mahal, former WWE champ, SmackDown champ, um, he's a guy that has, catches a lot of flack a lot of times from the fans, but because he came out of nowhere, you well, gotta understand about this this guy. This is a guy who was a, a comedy character essentially in 3MB, um, gets let go by WWE, goes over to Japan and becomes a world champion. Then gets himself in absolutely shredded condition, comes back to WWE, and is a completely believable main event heel character. I loved his title run. I thought his feud with Randy Orton was awesome. Um, I absolutely enjoyed it. I want to see Jinder back in that main event scene. Um, I think he is as believable a big, scary heel as there is. And shout out to Ginger, just announced, signed a five-year extension with WWE. So he isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So that's, that's pretty cool. Awesome. He also just got pinned on the plane for the 24-7 title. <laughs> <laughs> you know what was really good? Did you guys see the one where he's on the golf course with yes. R-Truth? And, and he shows up in his ring gear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gotta tell you guys, I love the 24-7 title. And also, shout out to Jinder Mahal, who just had surgery last week. Um, so he's going to be out for a little bit. But, like, shout out to him. And the WWE for still, like, re-upping his contract, because that's a really cool move. Um, but, like, yeah, like, he is, he's a ton of fun. Like, I love the 24-7 title. It's so funny to me. Like, I love seeing, uh, oh, who is it? Drake Maverick get pinned at his wedding. At his wedding, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the picture afterwards, where we're staying ever and he's at the bar. <laughs> yeah, that's I love that stuff. I actually want um, Chris Rose as the editor on the book, um, an editor here. We've joked, him and Eric Harbour, who I mentioned before, we've joked about getting a 24-7 title at the office. And then just having like a couple hours every Friday where you can pin whoever is the champion and like we can have some bit of chaos in the office. I'm not sure if HR will say okay to that, but I, I just need to get a 24-7 title for that reason. I'm putting, uh, just, it, I'm putting it out there. A 24-7 one-shot would be hysterical. To see that, to, uh, that shows the chaos that is the 24-7 title. A title we all made fun of because it is kind of an ugly-looking title, but it has been the highlight of Raw and SmackDown over the last several weeks um, would be incredible. Yeah, and speaking of WWE, just so everybody knows, um, we are publishing more WWE comics. Uh, when you're hearing and we're listening to this, we won't have announced it quite yet, but before and maybe during San Diego Comic-Con, you're going to get some news. I know fans have been asking, media has been asking. We have more WWE comics coming. Uh, we are not ending our WWE publishing line with my 10 days gender bump. All story. Uh, we have a lot more to come. We love working with them. They're great partners. Shout out to Steve Pantaleo over there. We work with all the time to Joe Villa, to Craig Tello, all the awesome dudes over there and people, women, everybody, um, you know, non-binary people of, of every kind there we work with. And uh, uh, so shout out to them. And we got more cool plans. I think you're going to be very excited when you see what we got coming next. Uh, 
I will say after our conversation last time, I went over to Chris and I was like, the boys at CBSI said we should be doing more Alexa Bliss variant covers. So the oh, message is okay. passed. They have, they have heard it. I said, we need more Alexa Bliss, more Becky Lynch. Um, and so uh, I can't make a promise to you right now, but I can tell you the message has been passed. So when you, the fans, talk to your boys here at Comic Book Invest, it get passed to me and I take it with authority and I pass it over to the people here and who knows what to do with it. We'll find out. <laughs> hey, that's getting it done for sure. We appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I, oh, look, that's the other book. I've been investing in those, some of those like event books. Like I want the first appearance of the bat armor with Azrael. So I have, you know, Batman 500 for that reason. I got eventually Superman 500 for the first, you know, Superboy and the first steel and the first time Hank Henshaw cyber, um, cyber Superman. They got to get to that stuff eventually, right? Yeah. I got the first Kyle Rayners, and like those are the things that you know they're going to get to. Um, but yeah, you know, look, we got more. Like I said, we got. Uh, I'm going to pivot back to wrestling. We got some more wrestling. We got some awesome WWE comics coming. Like we hear your passion. Chris is a diehard combat sports uh, enthusiast, if not expert. That guy travels to UFC stuff. The giant WWE fan. You know, every week we talk about what's gone on with wrestling. So. Um, we, we're absolutely going to be bringing you more of that um, with some really sick covers, too. We've talked about on the channel, uh, Andy and myself, we were at Heroes Con a couple weeks ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. Big comic convention, really focuses on independent comics. And one of the things we were trying to do um, was network. I, I went and talked to a ton of creators, publishers, um, aspiring authors, writers, and uh, pitched the channel, talked to them about... Um, you know, trying to network and get, get to know some people and see who we could get on the show, uh, see if people had seen our work. And I would love to know from you, Arun, from a publishing side, um, some tips for those of us maybe who have a YouTube channel, those of us maybe who are aspiring writers or artists. Um, how should we go about trying to network with publishers? What are some maybe some do's and don'ts? And um, what are some maybe tips uh, and advice you have for those of us trying to get into the comics game uh, and trying to kind of approach you guys. Yeah. I mean, I, this is going to be a really general one. It's just like, just be cool and be yourself. Cause honestly, like it, it don't, don't worry about like turning, playing whatever character, like you don't need to be the rock with a catchphrase. You don't need to be like dressed in a suit. You don't need to be like, just be yourself. And like, Anybody worth their salt who's meeting you is not going to be like, what a joker. He was wearing a, I'm going to say Toronto Raptor shirt, but I'm the only Canadian here. Um, you know, like if you're the convention, you're like, you run a press site. Like, I mean, like this is how dumb shower, um, groom, um, look presentable. It sounds silly. Don't have like, if this has happened, don't have Cheetos stuck in your beard, like Cheeto dust. Like it's not that it makes you a bad reporter, but like first we can like it or not, but first impressions have a huge impact. And what I can tell you is, as someone we talked about last time, we started at CBR and it was on the outside coming in. There's a lot of us like this on this side of the business. And we just want to help people who want to support comics, right? Like running any kind of comic site, I want to say thank you to anyone of you who did, does it. You don't get into it for the money, right? Just like you don't get into comics for the money. You get into comics because of love. And that's a commonality we all have. So remember that. We're all in comics, whether it's marketing, writing, art, lettering, coloring, reporting, investments. We're all in it because of love, right? We're all sitting here on a, a, in, a, at night doing this because we freaking love comics. And so remember that. And I want you to keep that in mind because when you go approach someone, um, and if let's say you're coming to the Boom Studios booth and you're at San Diego and so you meet someone there. You know, um, what I would say is like, if you're, if you're looking for a press contact, they're not there, have a professional business card to give them. And for the love of all things holy, do not have a, the word aspiring anywhere on that card, please. If you write, you are a writer. If you, if you blog, you are a blogger. You are not aspiring anything. Like remove that from your lexicon, remove it from your brain because You've taken the first step. You're doing what 99% of other people don't do. You're doing the work. And then, yes, there is like, you know, there is that, there is the 1% of the 1%, like my dear brother, Donnie Cates, who like rockets up to the top. But you people forget 
when he did Buzzkill, when he was a Marvel intern and his whole journey over these years um, to get to where he got to, the seven, eight years of this dedicated journey. And so don't forget to, um, don't forget to uh, remember you're playing a long game and just be decent. So have a professional business card, give it to someone. They may pass it on. Ask for a business card, bad. Ask for a contact. But don't do the thing where like, Monday after San Diego, you email someone like, hey, I haven't heard back from you yet. What's up? You know, like, yeah, you haven't heard back because everyone's exhausted from that giant show they just put on. At the same time, like, don't wait three months to get back to them either. You you got to feel it out. And like, if you hit up someone, you don't hear back, please don't do the thing where you email them back the next day. Like, I'm a big believer in the 24-hour or one business day turnaround on emails. But I'm, I, after we're finished this, I got to write something that I'm late on for someone. So like this stuff happens. So what I'm telling you is um, be professional. And I know in that moment, it feels like it's uh, everything has to happen now, but it, it doesn't. So just play the long game, be a regular, decent person. And, and you know, like y'all are, we all already have something in common. You and me, whoever the you is uh, listening to this, watching this, we love comics. We're good. If you don't love hockey, don't tell me you love hockey. Like, you don't need to suck up. But if you do love hockey, I'd love to talk to you about hockey. That's cool. Like, that's not going to get any more coverage, but it makes you a human being to me. So if you're a press outlet coming up to me, don't ask me for Grant Morrison the first time for an interview. Don't ask me for, you know, Brian Azzarello the first time. But, like, remember that these people have limited bandwidth. And if what I did when I was at CBR and I started getting, uh, dealing with these outlets with, with these publishers of course, I'm going to have to ask you for those big ones. I just didn't expect it. Look for the books that you think might be getting less press right now or creators who get less press. And on some level, you can hit them up on Twitter, sure, and do that. Or if you work your publicist, you'll probably get an answer faster. And so, uh, you know, we can connect you with some of those folks. But don't also know what you want to cover. Don't be like, we'd love to cover any creators who are available. Like, be precise. Don't be afraid to ask and get the no's. And then pivot to the other side of where you ask for something so broad, you don't get anything in return. So like, that is my, um, that's a big piece of advice for me. I don't know. Tell me before I ramble on more, like, what did you observe? And when you were networking, like what, what did you find worked for you or didn't work for you? Cause I'd love to hear what y'all found for. Well, I, for the last four years that I've been doing this at Heroes Con, this is the first year where it was like really heavy Simplements comics promotion. So we're trying to really promote the YouTube channel. Um, and it's funny, you hit on a, couple of things that I did that I really found successful. One thing was, shout out to Brian, sent a bunch of business cards to me. So having that business card to be able to pass out, I noticed made a, a difference. The other thing I did was I printed off what I call a one sheet. So I printed off one page that it had a mission statement. It explains what we do on the channel. It explains what this show, the Indie Spotlight series show is. It gave a little bio on Andy, myself, Brian, our social media, um, and comicbookinvest.com. And I found that having that with the business card to pass out allowed me to not have to do so much explaining. And I think it separated me from other people who were trying to do the same thing. Um, and I also found, like Arun had just said, that you know, having that report, I, people were really receptive. Right? I, it didn't matter whether I was talking to Matt Kent or Cullen Bunn or um, you know, some up and coming person, uh, kind of like Ben Bishop or, you know, more on the kind of the independent side, uh, people were really receptive just to your passion. They could kind of feel that it was something that I was excited about. And like one thing I'm a big believer in, don't tell somebody you're a fan of theirs if you're not a fan of theirs, if you don't know their work, because you're going to get into a conversation you're not going to really be prepared to, and they're going to know. So, you know, I, I try to be genuine. If I haven't read something or I haven't checked something out, I don't have a problem being honest with that. And I find that rather than the creator being like, you know, turned off by it, instead they're encouraging me to check this out or check that out. Um, and then the other thing that I found that worked really well, and I've been doing this for a few years, is it kind of how you mentioned not necessarily walking up right off the bat and going for Brian Azzarello or somebody like that. I've been able to make relationships with people who I felt like were on the rise. So people mm -hmm. that I, that weren't getting like that attention you said. So, um, you know, four or five years ago, I interviewed um, Matthew Rosenberg far before he was the Matthew Rosenberg he is today. 
I, my very first on video interview was Donny Cates far before he was the Donny Cates he is today. Um, and because it, so I was able to work with those people, Jason Latour is another one, um, work with those people early on. I've been able to build a rapport that now as they are the people that they are, I can still reach out to those people. I can still get access to those people. Donny Cates is going to answer my questions. He's, he's verified some first appearances for us in the past and things like that. And you're going to be able to build that through that networking. The, the thing that you said that I'm the most like, I, my ears were tuned into is the follow-up because that's the stage I'm in right now. So um, I'm trying to follow up with people. I gave, I did what you said. I gave them kind of a week because I didn't want, I knew some people were traveling from all over the place. It's con yeah. season. They got to get back and work on their books, um, things like that. So I've given them some time and now I'm in that process of I need to follow up with the people that I spoke to to try to get to that next step. And that's kind of that point that I'm at right now where I've got to finesse that world. Like you said, I don't want to be pushy and I don't want to be, you know, too forward, but I, I want to try to make sure people know that, Hey, I was serious and, and genuine about what I said at the convention. And I, I would like to work with you. Yeah. I think, I think that's all really good. Like, look, it's, um, some of the best relationships I made in comics were from people who were like, Hey, you treated me awesome when I was like nobody and getting my first start. Like when I would, if even working at Marvel, I'd be, you know, hanging up publicity there and they'd be like, you treated me like I, I mattered. And I'm like, of course you do. You're writing a comic. Like, you know, and I think as a, as a press person, if, if treat everybody you meet, whether it's that person working at the booth, whether it's the publicist, whether it's a creator, treat them, treat them all the same. And I'm telling you, you're going to find, like, I don't want to sound like all like LA hippie about this, but like put that good energy out there and it'll come back to you eventually. Like we're all in this together. Like, and if you don't love a book, don't say you, you love it. Also, you don't need to tell me you don't like it either. Like you don't need to volunteer here. It's not your thing. Um, just move on. Uh, and I think that's the thing that's really important is to make sure that you're genuine. And I know authentic is such an overused buzzword, but be authentic, be your real self. And like, look, the three, the, the four of us, we never talked before our last inter the last interview. We all get along great. And we all like DM and email each other now about stuff. And like, that's cool. And it's like, it all works because we're just being human beings with each other. Right. And like, um, but again, the advantage we have right here is we all love comics. It's all why we're in it. You, it. Movies and TV you can get into for the money. You don't get into comics for the money because it's, it's not nearly as much of a sure thing. And so, uh, and if it is a sure thing, I somehow missed that boat on it. <laughs> I swear, they pay me well. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's like writing comics. I'm not doing it because it's like, I'm going to make a crazy amount of money off it. Boom pays me a fair rate, page rate. But like, it's just how I love it. And so... When you can give coverage to people like that, they remember it. And when you're doing it genuine and you're and the other part of it is to like act like you've been there before. Like there's one thing to get a photo and maybe you're like, oh, I, I really love this book. Can you sign a copy? But like then don't be hanging up. Be like, hey, can I like send you 10 copies of this other book signed, like shift back to me? And like don't like it sounds silly, but people will take it. Sometimes when you open a door for people, they want to force their way through it all. And they're, and they're like you only want to just. You just want to give them a little bit of sliver into your life. And like, I don't like play the long game, just play the long game. And I promise you it will pay off for you when you need something the most. And then when you ask for something, people will say, Hey, Andy or Brian or Jack, they're asking for something. And it must be something big. Cause they've never asking me. Y'all don't ask me for anything. Like you're not hitting me up for like to be hooked up with things. Like I know that, like, that's like, and, I, and we, that's good because I would hate for us to like, we don't want to have that relationship. And right. it's like, but also that's how I know you're professionals. Why well, I want to do this again. Cause it wasn't like we talked and you're like, Hey, by the way, do you have the uh, Goni Montez variant to Power Rangers number nine? So I can have another first appearance of Draken. You know, like you're not, you're not doing that. You're, um, you're folk, you're like, you're, you're just being professionals. And like, I think, I know people will say, man, I can't afford business cards. Okay. And if you can't, I get it. Let me just tell you, like, you should try to afford them. I know they're not the most expensive things, but if you can't afford them, I respect that. Then you better have, like, you better have a process where you ask other people for their cards. And honestly, don't tell someone I can't afford business cards. Just, just say you're out. Just say you're out. It's fine. You know, I won't, I don't, no publicist cares enough to question that in their head. They're like, cool, you're out of cards. 
Um, what I did when I run out of cards now, I'm just like, hey, here's my phone. Just type my email address, uh, type your email address into this email. I'll say hi from Boom. It's Arun. Now just email me after the show. Like, do you just and like find those solutions if you can't afford to do that. Um, and you know, just be a human. And understand that. Understand that people are busy. And please understand. We sometimes drop the ball, not because we're out to get you and don't value you, but because stuff just happened. And if you can give us that, cut us that slack, we'll cut you the same slack too. Awesome info. Uh, Vista Print's a good site for, for business cards. You can get them cheap and all the way up to, you could probably get gold plated ones if you want. But um, Vista Print, or even those ones where Staples has the, you could print them at home and they yeah. have templates for them. Uh, or, I mean, just do what, do what you have. Or just do, like he said, with the one sheet and put your contact information on a one sheet yeah. and kind of just explain not a lot of detail, not like 10 font, make it simple and what they have so you, you kind of get your message across. And they'll thank you for that. And I want to touch on one thing you said, where you said uh, we don't ask you for things. I also treat, I mean, you and everyone else we met from Mad Cave to David Boer, we're building that relationship. I like the relationship we have. It's almost like a friend relationship. So I think, hey, if I don't sit there and ask my friends for stuff all the time, I'm not going to turn around and do the same thing with the people that we've been talking to and meeting on here because I just enjoy the conversation and it makes me like those books that much more. Now when I buy books from the people we've talked to on this on any Spotlight series, there's more to it. There's more of an attachment to it because there's a relationship formed with the creators or the publishers so you're seeing it from a different level than I would coming in just saying, because before we had the interview, when we talked to you last time, I can tell you without a doubt, I probably wouldn't have bought Angel or any Buffy books, but now Arun talked about it. Let me see what's in it. Glad I did, because I've been loving awesome. those storylines. Awesome. Yeah, I think like, no, look, I think you're hitting on it, which is just, you got to, you got to think outside yourself with this stuff. And look, if you're, if you were a writer or artist, notice or colorist letter, notice I did not use the word aspiring. I don't want to hear that word. I love, Remove it. Remove I love it. that. Donnie Cates had that tweet this week talking about that. I don't know. I, I don't know if you saw these, the, the same thing to a fan who had kind of tweeted and said, I'm an aspiring comic book writer. He said, don't say that. If you write, you're a writer. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's funny. Uh, I hosted his spotlight panel at WonderCon and we had the same conversation with the audience there, which is like, take that aspiring stuff out of your mouth. Like that is not a word you need to use. If you are aspiring, you don't show off about it, right? You're, you're, you're a player, you know, you're in here. Like, you know, it's, uh, I'm thinking like hockey for some reason, but like, but let's say baseball, if you're a triple A player, you're not an aspiring MLB player. You're a triple A player. You own that stuff. You got further than most people will ever get. Okay. I don't think I can even throw a fastball to the home plate. If I, I, I'd probably hit the dirt and like turf it. So like be like own everyone. I'm telling you, like I did this presentation recently. Uh, I'm not sure. Are, are you all fast and furious fans? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like diehard. I took two days off work this year for Hobbs and Shaw. I'm not kidding. Just two days to go watch it. Um, and I already booked off my vacation days next year for Furious 9. I got two more days off for that too. And I booked off two days in 2021 for John Wick 4. So like I, I'm, 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 I like this, is, I am straight up prioritizing, but I gave this um, presentation with Asana, who's this um, task management software company that we work with. I was there at an, an event and I gave it about the, Business lessons you can learn from Dominic Toretto, right? Because he's run a very successful business um, with uh, in Fast and Furious. Um, he's run a he's run a really strong business. And one of the things I said is that you have to realize, and what what you realize in the Furious Five uh, team scene, right? When they're telling you what everybody's going to do, every single person, even if it's Tyrese, who's the his Romans, the butt of jokes there, right? Every person in that movie is good at something someone else isn't good at. So Dom may be the best driver, but he can't infiltrate places the way Han can. He can't smooth talk the way Roman can. He's not a hacker, um, or he's not as good with computers as uh, as Tej somehow is, because Ludacris can do everything, right? Like, everyone is the best at something, and remember that you are really great at something. So... As a writer, maybe you don't write like Donny Cates and you don't like write like Jason Aaron or John Hickman. That's okay. Figure out what you do really well. 
You know, like, don't worry about being the next someone. Worry about being the first you. And I know how cheesy that is, but it's true. Because, like, I look, using the Jinder Mahal story as an example, uh, that is a different version of the story than Donnie Cates would have written or Jonathan Hickman or Jason Aaron would have written. We can debate the merits. I'm pretty sure the Jason Aaron version of that story would be awesome, and I now want to read it. Um, so, Jason, if you're listening, I want your Jinder Mahal story. But, like, you know, I just leaned into the stuff that meant something to me, and that's like that's all I can do, right? And I can't worry about how to compare. So am I an inspiring writer? No, no, I'm a writer. And, like, everyone's got to start somewhere and do their thing. And so, like, own own it. Walk in with that confidence. And if you're these – if you are in a creator like this and you want to get hired somewhere, um, r- approach people the same way. Like if you're fresh, be respectful. If you see them at a bar or some drink up, say, Hey, exchange contact information. Don't like overwhelm them and just like, you know, have a conversation. And then if you're going to have those conversations, don't be the artist who doesn't have samples ready online. Don't be, you know, as a, and look, as a writer, it's the hardest thing. You can't submit scripts to be reviewed, right? No one can take unsolicited pitches. Please don't do it. What you can do and what you should do is you should, um, uh, you know, keep writing, self-publish online, have something you can show someone. If you want to write comics, but you write a novel, hey, that novel is great. If you want to write comics, but you write a TV, that's awesome. You're probably getting paid well. and like. Then you can like that can show how you write. But like if you write, you need to write. You need to like you need to start somewhere like, look, I have been I've uh, there is in this process of working with Boom on the creative side of things, which is separate from my day job. And um, there's things I've pitched they said no to. And I just keep pitching because uh, for everything they say no to, there's a gender mahal or an IRS story they say yes to. And so You've got to keep doing, you got to keep, you got to keep, keep creating. No one's stopping you from going to Kickstarter. No one's stopping you from just buying, you know, um, not that Brianwood.com and like writing your web comic there every day, right? Or every week or whatever schedule you can do. No one's stopping you from going back in the day with digital webbing, deviant art. I don't know what it is now. No one's stopping you from networking on Twitter or Instagram, finding the, the, the artistic talent you want, or conversely, finding the writer you want to work with. No one's stopping you from creating. It's never been easier. You got to go do it. And so make sure when you make those connections, don't be like, Hey, I, I really want to be, I, I want to be a comics writer. Hey, don't phrase it that way. Be like, Hey, I'm interested in writing for, let's use an example. I'm interested in writing for Boop Studios. Cool. Love the confidence kiddo. Um, that sounds bad kiddo. Love the confidence human being. Um, what have you worked on? If you're like, oh, I'm working on stuff. I'm hopefully going to publish something soon. Like, you may be able to follow up with that person. But when you shoot your shot, make sure you're ready. Like, um, Make sure you're, you've got your stuff lined up. Because we talked about first impressions. Someone may forget you and you come back to them later. But you don't want to be the person who didn't, who didn't do the work somewhere, right? Who didn't have their webcomic or hasn't done work somewhere else. And... You know, part of this networking is as you meet other creators, maybe talk to those creators and you're like, you know, and you find the right creator who's willing to read your scripts or willing to read your pitches, um, who's willing to who's willing to help groom you with that. But you're going to have to do the work, too. They're not there to help you break your stories. They're not there to, to do multiple edits. If you find someone willing to take time to review something, you send them. You get a shot. They'll give you your notes. They're not going to now check if you did the notes right. It's not going to happen for the most part. So like you got to just make sure you got your you got your stuff together. And like if you're an artist, always have new samples. If you're a writer, keep creating new content regularly. That is, it's tough. It's a really tough business, and you've got to find a way to differentiate yourself. And um, I'm telling you, if I uh, Ross, please don't fire me. But if I got fired tomorrow. And I was pitching stuff, I'd be going through the same process. I'd have to be like, I'd be going to Kickstarter, I'd be publishing digital comics, and I would be networking and writing scripts every waking minute I, I got. I do that right now on the weekends. I spend eight or 10 hours every week uh, either uh, trying to break new pitches or writing scripts to see if the pitch sustains. I've, there is one pitch I have been working on for a year, and I have written the scripts. 16 times and I'm trying to, and I'm not there. I just can't figure it out. But every so often I get my, try to get my brain back to try to figure it out. But like, 
I'm getting closer one day, maybe. And I keep and I'm working on other stuff. And like, you know, this is, um, you've got to challenge yourself. And here's the other thing. You've got to give yourself deadlines. So the Jinder Mahal story is an example. Like, I don't have a ton of time. I had two weeks to write um, the Jinder Mahal. I had two weeks to, uh, from when I got assigned the story to deliver the Jinder Mahal story on deadline. Two weeks is a long time for 10 pages. Honestly, it's a really good amount of time. Chris was very cool to me. I got assigned it on a Thursday and I told myself I need to have this done by Monday because Chris just gave me a shot. And if I, and I know I'm going to be working like crazy. And if I don't get this done, um, I'm going to be so close to that deadline. I want to reward Chris's faith in me by delivering something. So I drove myself nuts over that weekend and I got the script on Monday. And it's just like, that's, and you have to do it, man. Like, I'm going to tell you, the other thing I said uh, in this presentation was um, everyone has the answer if, if you're honest with yourself about it. And that's, again, uh, I, I don't need to go through all the Fast and Furious comparisons, but like in any situation, if someone's like, hey, what do you think you should do? You're probably afraid to say the answer. But if I'm like, no, you just got to tell me, you'll blurt out what your instinct is, right? So what I've been teaching myself to do is write under like ridiculous, not ridiculous, but tight deadlines so that I teach myself to hone those instincts. You're doing, you're putting in the reps, hone your instincts. Cause whenever you're stressed out, you, res, you, res, you revert back to instinct. You're so train yourself for those that train your instincts to be better. And so, um, you know, for any talent there, just put yourself to deadlines. I'm not saying you have all the time in the world. I'm lucky that my wife allows me the time on the weekends to write because we don't see each other much during the week. We both work schedules like I leave work before she does some days and then you know, she sometimes will leave work before me I'll get back later or vice versa but like we're ship we talk we get a chance to see each other for like two minutes in the morning um you know we wake up say hi I love you and when we come home at night we maybe if we're lucky talk for 10 minutes so weekends are precious now if you have kids if you have other stuff in your life I'm not disparaging you I'm not saying you have to assign yourself my crazy deadlines but you've got to hold yourself to a deadline you got to figure out your deadline. You've got to put a time constraint on it. Um, and you've got to just get it done. The only way to do the work is to do the work. Then when you sit down to talk to people and you've shown them, hey, I have a web comic going up every monthly, right? Weekly, daily. You've shown them you know how to hit a deadline. You've shown them you know how to make a comic. And like that's really important to do. And speech. <laughs> Another thing I liked when you talk about the professionalism, that it's something I, that I thought about that I saw and I see at conventions. Um, you know, we're all, like you said, we're all collectors. We're all, um, we're all into the hobby. Um, and I know Andy, I'm sure you can relate to this because when we were at Heroes Con, you know, you got to wear different hats. So sometimes you're Andy Tomlin from the Indie Spotlight series. Sometimes you're Andy from Bat Comic Shop. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're just Andy the fan. And something that I want you guys to realize when you go there is try to make sure when you're presenting yourself as, you know, whether it's a member of the media or an aspiring writer, that you're not also there trying to get 12 signatures at the same time. You're not yeah. also there with like a stack of books falling out under your arms. Try to, you know, make sure you're, you're separating those. Put your, when, when I put my Simple Men's Comics hat on and I, and I walked it, that's what I was trying to do. So I wanted to present myself, uh, and obviously, even the simple stuff that Arun said, if you know anything about a comic convention, please shower, please wear deodorant, please do all of that, because comic conventions get nasty. And especially down here in the South, uh, you know, we were down here in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, it's hot down here. But um, yeah, I could have made, made a trillion dollars on a deodorant stand, is all I'll tell you. Um, but you know what? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have made a dollar, because nobody would have bought it from you. That's <laughs> yes, the sad, you're probably right. That's the sad probably thing right. about it, but... <laughs> You, know, you, said, you, got, you got to tell them the deodorant has a low print run. Right. You limited find a variance on it. And then they hide a variant, man. You got to do it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the absolute truth. That's the absolute truth. But that, but it is, it is the case because, you know, Andy and I were on the convention floor. We're looking at books. At the same point, you know, we're trying to do, you know, interviews and things like that. So, I, when I went up to these booths, I wanted this, them to see me. So now we were lucky. I had this Simple Women's Comics shirt or CBSI shirt. Um, I, you know, I'm presenting myself the way that I want to be presented. 
Um, did I go up to those creators later and get some signatures, whether it's for giveaways for the channel, for myself? Sure. But I, I didn't do it in a manner in where I was coming off like, like a rude saying where I'm, I'm asking you to be on a show. I'm asking you to sign books. You know, I'm asking you five questions about your book. And I didn't want, you don't want to overwhelm somebody in that way. And you want to make sure when you walk away that you left the impression that you want to leave. And um, not coming up there and coming and asking for too much and doing too much and giving that impression of who are you? Are you, are you just to make it personal for myself? Are you, are you AKA Mr. Bolo from Simpleman's Comics? Or are you Jack trying to get 12 books signed um, at that moment for CGC? You know, you got to make sure you separate those two. Yeah, and I think you also, when you walk up to someone, just be honest about what you want. Don't do that thing where you small talk and then you want something. People will respect and respond better. You can walk around, hey, my name's Jack. I want to actually talk to you. Like, I'm a writer. I'm looking for opportunities. Um, and it, like, if you recognize someone, um, this sounds so arrogant. If you know me, like you see me at the show and you're like, hey, I saw you on this thing. Walk up to like, hey, I saw you on, uh, I saw you at Simple Man's Comics. Um, you know, I'm looking to get connected with someone. I'm a writer. I'd like to talk to someone about opportunities. Just be straight up. Don't be like, hey, man. So uh, I heard P.K. Subban got traded to the New Jersey Devils. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, and then be like, and then, and then, then try to sneak in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, speaking of, like, I, I want to write comics. Because I'm going to tell you, we all can see it in your eyes. We all can see when you're trying to get there, you're not that good. And I say that as someone who's a terrible liar. So, like, you're not that good. Just be freaking honest about what you want. Like, don't, don't suck up. Because here's the, thing, here's the thing about lies and about artifice eventually you'll be exposed and you got to deal with it. So like just create less work for yourself. There's no, there's no um, BS to deal with if you don't create the BS. So just be straight up with someone and you'll find they want to help you. And again, first impressions, like Jack was saying, like separate those situations. Um, my old boss at CBR, Joanna Weiland, uh, when I used to work in comic resources, remember when I called him from Marvel as a publicist, we were arguing about something. And so like we were done arguing and like, and I was like, Hey dude, so like, how's it going? And he's like, Hey dude, you know what? Like we're talking to professionals right now. He's like, why don't you just like, why don't you just like hang up, like call me back and like, we'll talk as friends, but like, we got to keep these conversations separate. And that's an extreme example. And I called him up like, Hey dude, what's up? He goes, Hey, and he, this guy was a groomsman at my wedding. Okay. One of my best friends. I love him. He's family, but he's uh, but he like taught me that, which is like separate the conversations. Like small talk can be good. Sometimes you need it, but like, don't conflate friendship or those personal relationships with the professional. Like just, you know, um, be, uh, just be straight up about what you want. And everything will be better. So you were saying don't have Cheetos on your face and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know, I gotta tell you, you know, I said, don't have Cheetos in your beard. Taping them to your face shows dedication. To <laughs> what? I can't, I can't grow a beard real well. So, it would have been better <laughs> hanging out your nose. <laughs> that was good. That was good, Brian. But, yeah, that was a, um, a wealth of information from Maroon. So much so much good stuff there. I mean, even I just picked up on a bunch of information, stuff that between Jack's experience at Heroes Con and then the information that Maroon just gave out, um, it's definitely something to take note of. I want to make an offer to any of, any of your simple, any Simple Man's Comics viewers here um, look, I gotta first be honest. Andy's my favorite, so I'll let Brian and Jack figure out who's number two and three. Um, you know, it makes you know I'm just messing with y'all. But it's uh, uh, we should. Um, uh, what I'm gonna say is, if you see me at a comic con, what I want you to do is come up and be like, hey. And if you want, like, if you are going to be approaching another publisher and you're not sure how to do it, if it's Boom, I want you to know if you come up to me and you're like, hey. We're going to sign Simple Man's Comics. I, don't, I haven't talked to publishers much before. Apologies if I screw this one up. Cool. Don't worry about it. If you're like, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to go like talk to those folks at Dark Horse or Image or Marvel. Like, you know, like this is a new experience for me. Like, do you got any advice? I promise you, I will make a few minutes to talk to you. Don't get me when I'm clearly in running off somewhere else. But like, hit me up on Twitter if you want. But like, if you see me at a show, I'm happy to help. Like I'll see y'all. Uh, I won't be. I don't think I'll be at San Diego, but I'll see you at New York Comic Con. Just come say hi. You know, like uh, if you see me, I'm always happy to offer advice. 
Um, happy to sign WWE forever as number ones. Um, but like, ask for, uh, ask for, um, if you want advice, like, I don't know a better term than safe space, but like, it's a safe space to just come to me with and like, be like, Hey, uh, is this the right way to approach it? Cool. Like, let's have, the, I, I want to help you because like, the thing about all this is like the more good people there are in comics, the more good people there are in comics. And that's not a threat to anybody because you could never have enough good people. Right. And so, and you can never have enough talented people. And if you being talented is a threat to me, that speaks to my lack of talent more than it does to you threatening my position. I mean, um, so just, you know, uh, I'm always happy to offer that advice. Like I, I can't like, I can't jump in y'all with calls. Like I'm jumping on with my buddies here with Andy and my other two favorites. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, don't worry, Brian, next time you'll be my favorite. Brian, you are one of my two favorite Brian Woods. I promise. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And Jack Mayo is my favorite condiment. So like, I feel like I love you all differently. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, like I, I was going to say, you know, um, just like if I can help, let me help. And I'll tell you, most people are the same way. Just be like appreciative of their time. If you know you need a half hour with someone, like try, schedule that time. Don't try to get a half time on a sales on a show floor with someone or after a panel. But like, you know, I've had people come up to me after panels be like, hey, um, can we chat and like sometime after this? And there's random people I've had calls with for a half hour who I've never met who just have questions about comics. I don't mind doing that stuff. I can't do it every day. And every week is tough, but like, and I, and this is not telling you to tweet at me to have a call with me. But what I am saying is that like, let's all together find a way to like, all help out each other because that's what this, like we go back to the beginning of this, like we're all enthusiastic about like, we're all enthusiastic about Power Rangers and yes. we're all reminding you we didn't print enough angels. Like I'm not on this, I'm not on here to like, I'm not on here just to hawk some comics because if I was um, talking about X-Men for 20 minutes wouldn't have been a way to do it. Um, and also these guys wouldn't invite me back. They don't want me here just telling you buy this comic. It's, you know, it's a rare one in 50 variant or something like that, right? Like you can read numbers. You can do the math yourself. I'm here <clears throat> and these guys will tell you we connected because I, I hit them up on social to thank them for like turning me on to some things in my collection I didn't know were worth so much. It's 100% true. And like, 100 true. and then this interview yeah. stuff just came up after that. Um, and like, they know I'm on call anytime they need me, I'm around now. And they know the vice versa. I also know like these guys are like, hey, if you ever got stuff, you know, that's legit, let us know. And like, you know, we all, we all, um, we are all here to help each other. But like, that's how this was formed. This was formed just simply out of me thanking you. Right. And then this is like, I am now, I am now the champ champ of the show two yes. times um, oh, on this show. And like, they're, uh, you know, like, just remember, like, you should, everyone's here to help. Don't take advantage of it. Be, be judicious, find ways to connect and like play the long game, play the long game. And if I had hit these guys up being like, Hey, I want to promo boom books on the show. What time do you got? I would not, we wouldn't have the same conversation. I probably wouldn't have been on the show yet. And if ever, cause they'd be like, we don't need some guy who's just trying to promote himself and put himself over. You know, that ain't, that ain't good for anybody. That's not good content. That's not good. That's not what the show is about. Um, it's, uh, and so like, I think you know your audience, right? Like you don't approach these folks, this, these group, great folks here that way. Um, and you don't approach folks you meet at comic convention that way, approach them with respect, make sure you know your big question. You probably get five minutes with people know the thing you want to get to ask the question. And if you're nervous, that's okay. No one's going to dock you points for that, but don't like, don't overcompensate by like coming with all the swagger and be like, Hey, you know, I've got the best power in your story. It's going to sell like 500,000 copies. I just need to find you guys a way to give you, I need you guys to give me a chance. It's not happening. Like it's just not happening. All right. And if you're, if you're an interviewer, the first piece of advice I gave Andy, when, when he said, you know, I, I haven't been to a big convention. I've been to a convention. What do I need to know? First thing I told him was be ready. And I learned that one kind of early on because you know, when you're, 
when you're at a convention as a, as a creator, you've got a lot going on. You're trying to, whether it's sell books or sell artwork, you're trying to meet your fans. You're trying, you're going to be signing books. You're also going to probably be paneling. And then they're trying to network as well. And the time ends up getting taken up. So like Heroes Con was a three day show, but a lot of the creators were action packed. So when you go there and you say, hey, you know, at some point this weekend, I would love five minutes to talk to you for this YouTube channel or that YouTube channel. Be ready because they may look at you and go, I'm, I'm ready to go right now. And if you're not ready to go at that moment, then you may not get that opportunity. And I talked about that in my very first interview with Donnie Cates. Um, he was the guy he, I knew I wanted to talk to because Redneck had just come out and um, Baby Teeth had just come out and I could see where he was going. And um, I wanted to get grab him. I went right up to him at the Aftershock booth as soon as the show started, first thing Friday. But he knew what his schedule was going to look like. And that's what he said to me. He said, let's go do it right now. And if I wasn't prepared in advance to be able to go in and ask questions and have questions ready, I wouldn't have gotten that interview. And I learned from that moment on, just be ready. So preparation going into these shows. Every, every show has a website that lists the guests. Go through that guest list, do your research, make some notes, be ready so that when you do that interview, you you have some pre-prepared questions. Because like Arun said, it's okay to be nervous. It's okay to make some mistakes. I certainly have done plenty of that. But, um, you know, make sure that you have that knowledge ready so that if somebody says to you, I've got five minutes and it's right now, you're ready to go. Because again, you're on, you need to do what's best for them. You're on their time. You're the one asking them for value at that point. Where you provide your value is later once you put that content out and you can kind of get people on board with whatever they're trying to do. Yeah. And I think learn the, learn the art of it. And as someone who, look, I think we all can say I'm loquacious. Uh, I think we, uh, it is a hallmark for better or for worse. But if you were a professional, you are a professional interviewer because you were interviewing, period. There's no aspiring. But if you were talking to like TV or film talent, five minutes is an eternity to have them for. When you're going down those lines, you know, when you see those red carpet interviews, five minutes is an eternity. So comic creators tend to give you a bit more because comic creators are the best. Um, but remember, you got to be efficient and read the room. Like figure out like, uh, I got to remember, I got to tell you guys the dumbest question I ever asked in an interview, okay? I'm going to tell you how I didn't read the room. Um, Jim McCann, who is a buddy of mine, again, grooves at my wedding. He used to run PR at Marvel before I got there. And um, he was hosting a call with Daniel Way about Wolverine Origins when that book launched, so way back, right? And he, um, and they were asking questions. So I got on that call, it was one of those press calls. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna flex on this call and show him like, I'm gonna come with the smart question, like screw the spoilers, guys. So here's my question and it's, uh, <laughs> I go, hey, if you look at how Wolverine's been written and drawn in every decade he's been around, he has always been a mirror for modern ideas of masculinity. So what do you think your version of Wolverine says about modern ideas of masculinity? You can laugh because Daniel Way laughed and everybody in the phone burst out laughing. <laughs> I heard my own words. I'm like, I believe in the question, by the way. I actually do think Wolverine has always been like, what is, what is manly? And like it's filtered through there. I think it grows. However, that call was not the place to ask that question. I didn't prep Daniel for that kind of question coming. I should have read the room and said, um, they are, and I mean this in a nice way, softball questions from my peers. That is what he is prepped for. A question about defining masculinity is not going to get the answer it needs. So like, whether it's a good question or not, and you know what, Andy, screw you. I saw you laugh. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan oh, my favorite. He's sending me a hat. He my my reaction was that's like, Andy, you were dead to me. My reaction was that's a that's a great question. I kind of was interested to see what he was going to say, but I totally get what you're saying that in that environment where he's there to promote a book, that's why he doesn't really promote the book. How is that dead guy still laughing at us, Jack? <laughs> I have no idea. Because now my head's spinning. I'm like, man, you're kind of right about Wolf. I never thought about that. Like that, that well, was it's, a deep it's, question. Yeah, well, these are these are kind of like the dumb questions in my head because I'm like a dumb guy like this. But it's uh it's like that's the thing though, like you you have to know your audience, know the situation, and you gotta know how to pivot. You gotta not be offended, but like don't lead in with like 
if you're talking to Al Ewing about, um, you know, Immortal Hulk, right? That's definitely a book y'all talk about a lot <laughs> on, on CBSI. Um, Immortal Hulk number two, why I wish I bought the darn issue um, at cover price. But it's uh, like, don't start talking to Al Ewing about the first question about philosophy, about man and monster and like, you know, human nature. Like, obviously that's there in the metaphor, but like, maybe work up to it. See if you get there. And also like know that if you ask that question, he gives you an answer. You're going to use up a lot of your time. So make sure that's the question. You don't feel like you've been asked a million times. You're going to get a good answer for. Um, you really, you got to like, um, and don't, by the way, don't do that thing where people are like, I hear some people saying when it's really your opinion, like, don't do that. Like if, if there are people saying something like be like, Hey, you may have seen some chatter online. Here's this, here's these, here's these perspectives. But like, don't do the thing like some people are saying this is this um i've done that for a friend yeah yeah you know and my 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 late friend andy (laughs) because if you do i'll miss you but also i'll feel like i jinxed you now death (laughs) notes thanks man thanks um make it san diego that's all i'm asking man yeah no if i go y'all know what happened yeah (laughs) i cursed him um i'm like drake i just cursed him um (laughs) But like, you know, don't be like my, don't ask a question disguised as like a, an opinion disguised as a question. Like just, you know, get to know people and you can get to the place to have honest discussion. Um, but you also need to be ready for answers. You're not, you, you got to really think about what questions you're asking. Um, and then uh, dumb last little thing. Uh, this is, this is learn your pronouns. They, them, he, she learn learn your pronouns um it may not matter to you and i don't actually care what your opinion is on identity what i what it matters what matters to people is those pronouns matter uh it matters how people care about what their name what about how you uh how you say their name so like uh you know andy may not like being called andrew i should put some attention into how he's credited and, and not call him like think I'm being really smart like me someone named Chuck don't be like well Charles you know like respect them know how to pronounce their name um and if you don't know like if you meet me and you're like I don't know quite know how to say your name I'm so sorry how do you say it I'll be like it's Arun it's like Maroon without the M you know it's you know just like go with it uh and like no one's gonna hold it against you but just learn the basics out of respect the basics we all would want right and as you get to know people, I remember this first interview doesn't have to be your last. If you do it right, you can talk with them again. And so that's, that's, that's what you got to do. Um, look, as someone who Joe Quesada is a friend of mine, the first time I interviewed him for IGN back in 2000, I did such a bad job. He called me out on it. And he like kind of remembered it when I started working for Marvel. I was like, yeah, dude, look, I screwed that up big time. I was dumb. Thanks for like not holding it against me. It's like, ah, oh, man, you were young. You're figuring it out but he had to put me in my place. Like I didn't have to use a recorder. I thought I could take the notes and I sent him the transcript. He goes, dude, I asked you to use a recorder for a reason. I'm basically going to have to rewrite this whole interview. Now you've made me spend double the time on this. He still did it because Joe's a class act, but don't think you're smarter than the good advice. Record your interviews. Um, and also if you're having a conversation with someone about how to break in, it's not unfair to be like, Hey, can I just record this real quick? Whether it's your iPhone or like one of those recorders from like a radio shack. Um, just like, it may be good, especially if you're nervous to have the notes like that. Don't be afraid of like having that, you know, um, you know, kind of like trail for it. So, um, yeah, like, look, basic respect. Uh, and and again, um, I think if you want advice, like Brian, Andy, Jack are like two out of the three people here are really awesome. Um, you'll decide who the bad one is. Uh, it's Andy. Um, and so like, just make sure like, hit up people like this for advice. Like, you know, at, like if you don't ask people questions, they'll never ask people like me questions. Right. So like much like I was joking that, and but was serious that these guys mentioned what variant covers they want. So I passed it on to editorial, ask these guys questions. So when they get into conversation with these pros, you can get different answers. Like my gospel is different than, you know, someone else's gospel. Um, and everyone has a different path, but like you just, um, be a decent person, and I promise you, be an honest person. It will all work out at the end. 
one of the coolest compliments that we got about the channel, and I reached out to Brian and uh, told him, I don't want to, I don't want to name the name of the person who said it. I don't know if they would want that, but um, you know, I was doing a, a uh, covering a panel at Daryl's Con, and uh, you know, a, a creator and another podcaster said, you know, I've seen your channel, I've seen your show, and you know, we're three southern white guys, and uh, the person made the, the point. This is a person of color making the point of saying. You know, you guys, I've seen your show. You guys have had people of color. You've had uh, homosexuals. And, you know, and we've been, you guys are really respectful of those things. To be honest with you, we never even put any thought into that. It was just, like Farouk said, just try, you got to be a good person. You can have whatever opinions you want to have. Like Farouk said, I don't care. Um, give it to yourself. But the face of comics is changing. It's, it's, it is an inclusive place. And if you're not the type of person who is able to be um, open and respectful of people from all walks of life, you're going to struggle. Uh, it's just, it's not going to be there. And getting that compliment when that wasn't, it was something, so of course we want, but it wasn't something I had ever really thought of and said. I, it honestly didn't even dawn on me until the person said it, that we are three Southern white guys. Um, it just wasn't anything I had thought of, but um it was a good compliment. It made me feel like that we were making a mark and that we were doing something, leaving an impression for the audience. So, as you said, yeah. the pronoun is very big. Just here's the thing: like, like you said, whether whatever your views are on these issues, we can all agree we should be respectful to each other, right? So, part of that respect is knowing how to say someone's name or asking, is knowing their preferred pronouns, doing the work, and if you make a mistake. Don't get defensive, apologize, move on. Most people don't mind, but like, that's the thing. Like, this is not about SJWs or whatever. Like, this is not about politics. This is about professionalism. This is agnostic of political beliefs, religious beliefs. Just like learn the basics to have the conversation. Like, you know, it's, that's all you need to do. This is, is this is, uh, that will get you far in life in general. Um, but anyway, that's enough. For, that's enough uh, sermons from the mountaintop about uh, about comic about comic stuff uh, uh, about networking. Like, look, we've said it. You, you all get it. You're smart. You watch Simple Man's comics. You you go to CBSI. You're in the know. You know how this goes. Um, so you know, just uh, uh, these gentlemen give you good advice. Follow follow what they say. They're, they're they're two out of three are smart. One of them's really smart. Decide which one's which. Yeah. As, you know, <laughs> so as you guys know on the simple men's comics youtube channel we we have a tendency especially brian and i we have a tendency to butcher people's last names but when i'm at a convention i absolutely make sure i know how to pronounce that name that's where i learned sinkevich versus yeah. sinkowitz and everything else you have to know how to pronounce that name it makes a difference or or if you can't say his name just at, like say hi be like hey i apologize i'm i'm not Quite sure I've seen your last name. I don't want to butcher it. Can you just help me? Yeah, honestly. Yeah, honestly. So, um, yeah. Any other questions y'all got from the uh, from the the fans of CrossFit Moses out there? Or no, we good? <laughs> I love that. I love the CrossFit Moses. CrossFit Moses. I do too. Jesus that that came from uh, came from my buddy Brian Campbell over at CBS Sports, who has a who does a State of Combat podcast over there, and so uh, it's a name I found. <laughs> on i do not put it in my social media profiles because there's no way they ain't gonna get me in trouble <laughs> uh, you know uh, the backlash yeah yeah well yeah i, I do feel like there may be some dis insensitivity for using it there but like uh you know and of course for those non-wrestling fans uh, seth rollins is crossfit jesus i went to a uh, he has it him and uh joshi gallegos have been a, a, a really great <laughs> um endeavor called dead boys fitness you can sign up uh, it's a cheap price a month. You get like workouts every day. They show you how to workouts work. Joshy trains Cesaro. He trains. He trains Becky Lynch. He trains Bailey. He trains the Singh brothers. He's worked with Jinder. He is incredible. Um, at the workout I was at, you got to work out with Seth and with Joshy and some people. And then Becky Lynch showed up. This was around uh, Survivor Series last year. So her, she just had the black eye from Ronda. And then uh, Seamus showed up too, because he trained sometimes with him. So I got to meet Seamus as well. And like um, the Dead Boys Fitness, I really believe in it. Um, 
you know, and uh, if that's something you're looking to do, they're a great way to start. They scale the workout so you can do it all at home with just a pair of dumbbells or nothing at all. They're really great. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where the name came from working out with them. And so uh, Brian bestowed it upon me. Uh, but yeah, like that's uh, listen, um, I want to say again, thank you to three of you for having me on the show. It's always a blast. I appreciate the time to wax philosophically. I, th I think we both, I think we all thought we were not going to go this long again, but we did. Uh, so we all kind of knew what we got into. Um, what I'd love to say again in closing, because this is where I will be the guy hawking stuff now. Uh, like we talked about off air, I told these gentlemen what these story variants lead to, and at least one of them lost their ever loving minds. <laughs> uh, we can't uh, tell you which one of us because it might have uh, been too much spoilage, but yeah. uh, don't miss out. Yeah. Uh, so, ne you know, necessary evil again, don't miss out on Go Go Power Rangers 21. This is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 40. Don't miss on Go Go 21. Don't sleep on this first appearance of the Omega Rangers, okay? First appearance. Um, and the first appearance of Dane, a really cool dog character. Um, Angel number two, the first appearance of Fred, who has a big role coming up in Hellmouth, our new event. And again, don't sleep on Angel. These print runs, we, we appreciate everything the retailers have put in, but these books are moving fast at Diamond. There is not enough out there to meet demand. You saw Angel going for above cover price before the book hit stores. And I'm telling you, Angel number four, another big first appearance. You got to bolo that bolo. And again, Angel number one, uh, we didn't solicit traditionally through Diamond. All these covers, I'm telling you, especially this main one, you're not see them all. Each of these comics has had a one per store variant that has been really rare. Legitimately, stores got one per store. Um, you know, keep an eye out for it. But really, I just want you reading Angel because it's really good. Brian and Gleb and uh, the the whole team are um, are doing a great job. And I'll call it colorist Gabriel uh, Casada. Gabriel Casada as well, really great colorist. Um, and I need to call it colorist more. Uh, but, you know, they're, uh, they're doing a great job in this book. Check it out. It's really big to what's coming up in our whole Buffy verse of things. Um, so stay tuned. And, uh, yeah, uh, thanks again for the time. Thank you. Th again, thank you all for what you do. To all the people out there who are part of the hobby, thank you for, uh, you know, for investing um, in it. These comics are the best. Comic shops are the best. And, like, this is cool. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, I tell you, I, I, we can't thank you enough for coming back on here. Once again, we've learned more than we could have ever imagined getting into this thing. Uh, CBS I Nation, if you didn't learn anything from the last one, I'm going to tell you again, pay attention to what this man says because it, it happens. Okay. So, uh, like I say, you've been warned and, uh, be on the lookout for these books. Uh, he's, uh, he's not talking about them for nothing. Like I said, he mentioned a lot of first appearances, a lot of key events, and uh, don't sleep on them. I know these guys got a lot of big announcements coming up at uh, San Diego, so so stay tuned to that, too, and uh, don't miss that panel uh, either. All right, and one thing I want to do before we get out of here, you know, you guys know I'm content manager for CBSI, comicbookinvest.com, work here at the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. So I'm always interested in what you guys want to see as far as content, and um this will not be the last time we're going to bring a rune on the channel. For sure, we're going to bring them back. And just like this time, we, have, we wanted to ask some questions that you guys had after the first one. We want to know what you guys want to know from a rune in the future. So we're going to have a little uh, giveaway, a little contest. And what we're looking for is all you've got to do on this video is in the comments, just let us know. What else do you want to know from a rune in Boom Studios? What Whether it's about books, whether it's about getting into the industry, whether it's about Arun himself and his career, let us know. And what I'm going to give away for, for you is a book that was the biggest thing we talked about, uh, the biggest takeaway from everyone from our first episode is Bone Parish. Ooh. Now, I've got the trade paperback right here for Bone Parish. And something a little bit unique here is you see I've got the Heroes Con program. And uh, 
We got this one signed by creator Cullen Bud. That's awesome. Right there. And we are going to give that away to one of you from Simpleman's Comics YouTube family. Again, drop those comments. Let us know. And uh, somebody at random will be selected and get this book. If you haven't read Bowden Parish, you're going to get the opportunity. Plus, you're going to get a signed book for your collection. We're going to go ahead and send that right out to you guys. Right. And then as Arun's favorite person out of the three of us, I'll just go ahead and say that. <laughs> um, Arun, thanks again for coming on. It's always a pleasure. We love it. Like you said, uh, we always run longer because we have great conversations. And I love having these conversations because it kind of rejuvenates the whole comic book passion. We have um, talking about Boom, all the great titles that are coming out. So thank you once again. And those... If you're watching this and you aren't subscribed, make sure you subscribe, hit that subscribe button and that bell notification. Also click that thumbs up button. Let Arun know how much you like this video. Make sure you comment and be on the lookout because we always have more content like this coming up from Arun and other independent creators. And make sure you're checking out Andy's article on comicbookinvest.com, Andy's Spotlight Series article on there as well. And if you're looking for some of these independent comics, you can check out boomstudios.com. You can check out backcomicshop.com. Bunch of independent comics up there as well. So with that being said, thank you, Arun. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Andy. And we'll catch you next time on the CBSI Presents Indie Spotlight Series. Order one to future number one.